service doesn't escape you when you get into a conversation with someone who's trying to decide, do I eat Mm -hmm. and feed my kids or do, you know, what do I do? And I've seen that closer than Karen. And my mother has had to make some hard decisions, but I think she was ahead of her time um, and certainly her circle of friends to really not be distracted by the barriers that we faced. And I think that that's what we're called here to do is to not call out an issue that we're not going to be willing to help solve. Mm. And part of that is looking at not only the impact but a sustainable solution. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are watching In Conversation with Frank Schaefer as a live Facebook event, or you are listening to this as a podcast on uh, wherever you listen to podcasts. We're in a lot of places or watching on YouTube. And so today is a special day, a first for us, because we have two sisters, Uh, not in the theological sense of a great sisterhood, I mean actually sisters, with us today. Um, One is Taya Jackson Scott, and the other is Dr. Karen Scott, MD. They are both involved in medicine and education and social consciousness. Um, We're talking about um, obstetrics and Uh, OB world of racism. We're talking about social consciousness. We're talking about Morehouse that had uh, two Surgeon Generals, if I'm not mistaken, recently. So there's a huge range of stuff here, and I'm not going to pretend to know a lot. I'm not going to, you know, go through a bunch of questions and answers right away. First, I want to take advantage of the fact that you all are sisters and talk about family a little bit. And I'll just presage this by saying that Um, I tend in my writing um, as an author, both a novelist and nonfiction author, to really talk about my background in terms of informing who I am today, rather than pretending I'm sort of a professional writer or commentator and that I don't have a childhood and I didn't have a mother and I didn't have a dad and I don't have a journey. So if you'll forgive me, bear with me in that spirit, um, where I've started books talking about the fact that I got my wife, Jeannie, pregnant when we were 17 and 18, and that's 52 years ago, and we're together, and I, I'm a grandfather to five grandchildren, and I've done daycare for three of them for the last 13 years. That's the sort of thing we get into, and then we're going to go to the big strokes, what you're known for and who your life, uh, what your life is all about, but let's just start with the fact that you're both sisters. You know, How is it that you're sitting here together talking about similar and related subjects with a passion for these things. Who are your mother and dad? Where do you come from? Where where does all this start? What kind of a journey are you all on? Dive in, Taya or Karen, however you want to. You know, I think Karen and I are more than sisters. We are really um, connected spiritually, um, holistically we're connected. Um, Our mother is the inspiration of what we do. Her name is Edith Floyd and Um, She was a teenage mother who raised three girls. Mm. And part of that was a path of success. Now she charted a physical chart for us when we lived in East Nashville. And that pathway was a means to the end, right? So a lot of times when when you talk about walking to school, the normal pathway was there was a cut through for, for, for some of our friends who walked through the projects. And my mother charted a path for us to walk around that. Not that we were better, but she wanted us to, to, to be able to understand what our preferred future looked like mm-hmm. and what we could be. And that is a doctor, um, a healthcare administrator, and, and, and individuals to come back and serve those communities that we have lived in. And so, we really applaud her in, in moving past being a teenage mother and the statistics that go along with that, not um, taking in social welfare, but really working hard and showing us what that work ethic looked like on a day-to-day basis. And so we're inspired by her mm-hmm. um, and we have different fathers, but that we're sisters and we're sisters in service and we're sisters naturally and again, holistically. And, and so Karen, I don't know what, what you would love to say about that. 
Well, um, thank you for having us. And I think the way, you know, my sister like shaped, right, that, that landscape of what it was like to be nurtured and nourished and held accountable from by our mother, you know, I'm 10 years younger than my two sisters. So they're 11 months apart. Hmm. And so I come into my mother's life in her thirties. And I think that what I grew up where one part of her life ended. And so for me, being in a household of all black women and having, um, integrity and honesty as well as faith be one of the driving mm -hmm. motivators to how we're going to be successful so integrity and honesty our spiritual life our faith um, and education and mm -hmm. the way I remember my mom you know life lessons to me it may have been it probably could be perceived as harsh to others but my mother told me that she was very honest I can't help you get to where I want to see you Meaning mm -hmm. I don't have, you don't have a, uh, what is it like an endowment when you turn 18, there's no, there's no magical number of six figures or seven figures are going to pop up. Like you are going to have to work very hard. So I was motivated to do well in school because mm -hmm. I knew there was no other way. My mom was not going to be able to pay for me to go to school. Um, I knew I had to go to school because my two sisters, like my sisters, let me see you my sisters are. I'm like in the second or third grade of Warner Elementary talking about my sister's prom queen. My sister's the queen, senior, senior, senior prom queen, queen, senior prom queen, and then president of her class, Taya Valedictorian, top 10 of the class. Like they played, they were athletes and they were scholars. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I was like, oh, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to excel. I'm so also, I am also supposed to surround myself with other people who want to go the same way, place I want to go. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at our circle of friends, although there's a generational and a time difference, we're still very close to a lot of our really good friends that had shared values. We may have lived in different households. Other people had both same father and mother, like other things that we didn't have, but we, you know, we were right there with that. We had a very strong black woman head of household mm. and during the time of Reaganomics you know that I remember as I pursued higher education looking at how like public health and medicine epidemiology looked at single black female head of households that was actually a predictor of poverty of generational poverty and so I speak about that a lot that yeah I grew up in a, a single SBFH I remember that single black female head of household <laughs> and that era the 80s said that we were not going to do well we would end up in jail we would end up on the streets and not to dehumanize those where that path was there and there was nothing else there we were able to you know by blessings and other types of privileges we didn't go that way um, and I think it's also very important to know that though by the time I got to like middle school and above, though we moved and had a different zip code, right? And therefore a different predictor of success, I ended up still going to East Nashville for middle school, going to the same middle school that my two sisters went to, but it ended up being the second magnet school in Nashville, Meg's magnet school, Caldwell was first and then they moved to Meg. So I was the first graduating class of fifth through eighth grade in a magnet school. But I was back in East Nashville that we lived in North Nashville. I was still back to where it all started. So I think for us, it's always been a full circle. It's always been going back to your core values, always honoring your elders, always believing in the Black community, believing in Black men, believing in Black women, girls and boys, and, and the gender experience of people, like just always thinking about that and um, putting that as a part of our life. Like we were expected to do better and to be better That's and right. to think better all the time. Did you, did your mom uh, stay uh, and did these three girls grow up in the same house, same neighborhood, same apartment? Or was she, did she move? We, well, we, we lived in the same neighborhood together. And mm -hmm. that was one of the things that my mother felt was important was for us to stay together, be connected. And my oldest sister and I, Demetria, um, we were like a surrogate mom 
to Karen. Sure. And so the information that we received from school, we were we were training, we were teaching, we were schoolmasters, and some of the opportunities that we missed in exposure, we were exposing her to that. Um, Karen read at three years old. So Karen, Karen actually had three moms. She had three moms. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I get that Basically, because I have three. I have three older sisters. You know, sisters Hillary. And, that's right. And I had three moms because I had three older sisters too. I mean, four moms, whatever. That's true. Uh, yes, I get it. I get the thing. You know, when you're the youngest in the family and you're a little boy, and there's a ten year gap between you and your <laughs> sister, you understand that multiple moms deal. You yeah. Do. And, and, and they become the experiment, right? You know, yeah. uh, Hillary Clinton says that it takes a village. And it does. It, it does, does take a village. Hey, um, have either of you, uh, forgive me if you're all best friends and already know each other, but <laughs> have you run into Nicole Lynn Lewis um, and her book, Pregnant Girl? Mm -mm. Because I interviewed her a while back and she started this organization in Washington, D.C. that helps uh, young pregnant single moms. Um, she herself uh, came out of a very similar background to yours and wound up in college at age 17 with a child. Mm -hmm. And of course, her professors were very unsympathetic and did absolutely nothing to accommodate her. She's mm -hmm. written this book, Print Girl. I heard her interviewed on NPR about it, and I got in touch with her, and I've interviewed her on this, on this uh, podcast here. And, you know, she makes a good point in that um, she decided to spend the rest of her life trying to help people in a similar predicament, finish their education, keep their child, mm -hmm. move forward with their lives. And so it's interesting because in a way, my conversation with her was a good pre preparatory kind of passage. In fact, I, I quoted her in, in, a, in my latest book because I was so moved by what she was saying. So this story of yours resonates uh, very deeply. Now, during that childhood, uh, you're staying in the same neighborhood your mom, sorry if I put words in your mouth, but doesn't believe in teenagerhood and wants you to go from childhood into a responsible young adulthood. Is that right? That's it. Yeah. Um, she, she believed that education was the equal, equalizer. Um, and she knew that as far as the resources, she didn't have it, but she pushed um, us to really live above our age. And I think yeah. that all of us are really uh, wise beyond our years. In Is a your way mom that's, still alive? She is. She oh, good. Is she well? She's mm -hmm. great. Oh, that's great. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. So, uh, okay. Now, uh, during those years, you're in the same neighborhood. She's pushing education, young adulthood, and so forth and so on. You mentioned spiritual faith. Let's get specific. My dad was a Presbyterian minister. I, I came out of the evangelical white right wing uh, mm -hmm. that's morphed into the Trump uh Christian nationalism that's very ugly in many ways today. I left that 35, 40 years ago. I've spent the biggest chunk of my lifetime writing against this and trying to unpack it and undo some of the damage we did back in the 70s and 80s. What's your spiritual journey specifically? Um, what If you were going to church, what sort of a church and what's your connection with, with spirituality in a specific sense today, other than just generic words? It's an experience for me today. We grew up in a very traditional Pentecostal Assemblies of the World church. Mm -hmm. It was framed that, um, you know, we, we would often hear that education without sam salvation is damnation. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's better just to be spiritual rather than pursue education. Right. And, I, and I think that we learned um, from that is that our faith is how we live, how we thrive, and how we help others. Hmm. And, and I think that part of what our mother's uh, responsibility was is to, is to expose us to faith. And it was our responsibility to really understand and unpack what that, what that means. Hmm. Um, again, in a holistic perspective, and I'll use holistic starting with, 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 with the letter W, hmm. because oftentimes we don't talk about faith and what that means to someone that's young who knows what that means who understands yes. that and 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 part of the it became more religion and it became more dogma and it became more of what you could not do yeah. again rather than what you could become because if the word says that behold you're now sons of god that means that you have some access points that 
others don't have because of your belief. And I think that we take that to a, a sense of what we want that to mean for you, rather than that individual really exploring what that means for them mm. and, and how they can believe, how they can live, you know, without boundaries. Karen, in, in your childhood, do you have any memories of ever worrying that you weren't saved, quote unquote? I mean, you come from a church background, so I don't have, you know, ha half the people who I talk to, I'd have to explain all this too, but we're all on the same ter turf here. Oh, I know. Yes, we are sanctified. and Let's talk about that. We are holy rollers. Yeah, so I... I'll frame it this way, because as you were saying, like I when I when I when I facilitate presentations or give talks, I mm -hmm. start with my positionality, right? So I'm going to go that route by saying that by the time I came around, right, and in my youth, and this is like the what the 80s and 90s, and um, right, there's the socialization that happens in the home, there's a the socialization that happens in the church. There's a socialization that happens in the school system, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a socialization that happens in the health system. So again, as a young person navigating family, health, education, and church, and each of those systems have constraints mm -hmm. on how I choose what my identity is. I choose what my role is. I choose the relationships with whom I want to seek and what those relationships look like, it really became about power and control. Mm -hmm. So for me, I felt that there were more, you know, there was, there were more protocols and procedures around control and power who I could become as opposed to opportunities and options and exposures mm -hmm. to activate my power and potential to be whomever I want to be. And Again, if we are created in the image of God, then why are you constraining what the manifestation of my spirit, mm. of my identity, of my power is? And so it was difficult. Like I, even now it's difficult because, right, when you think about faith, spirituality, religion, and then let's say equity, and there mm. are points of tension there. That's right. And there are points of tension around, right, the isms and schisms, racism, sexism, you know, homophobia, queerphobia. So I, I will say for myself, the benefits of being raised in a church and going to church seven days a week is that I did learn discipline. Let me stop know. you there. Tell me the seven days a week part again, because that's, <laughs> see, we only okay. went twice a week. We went oh, by no, Wednesday no. night Bible study and Sunday morning. Talk, no. talk about the seven days a week. Okay, Sunday, Sunday school, morning, Sunday school, between Sunday school, there's a break and you fellowship and there's morning service worship and then there's a break and you either are still at the church because there's an afternoon service mm -hmm. or you go home and get something to eat and then there's afternoon program women's day men's day youth day the anniversary yeah. and then there's an evening service so and then there's i think monday we may have had a break i remember tuesdays i went to youth night we would worship we would fundraise money for the youth programs at church wednesday was bible class thursday was choir rehearsal for the adults Friday was Friday night prayer, Bible class. Saturday was young, young people's choir rehearsal. And then we go back. And so then that, that is just being a member. My mm. family also sang in the choir. Yeah. We were on the usher board. We were in very diverse ministry. So again, that I'm going to take away the beauty of that. I learned how to be a leader. My first public speaking engagement That's right. was because of the church. I used the technology that I was learning um, in the 90s at Meg's Magnus School. I won the, the IBM award at that time. You know, IBM and Apple were just really coming to be. And, and my dad is, you know, back in the day, an information systems analyst, so analyst. So for me to get that computer award, and that's what my dad does, I was hmm. printing out the signs, dare to be different. I remember to put over the altar at our church, the, um, the pulpit, forget youth day. So for me, intersectionality or bringing all those spaces together and systems, that's just what I've always done. But because, as my sister shared, I was exposed to different things from an educational pursuit, I probably challenged more. I would say challenged. People mm -hmm. can say rebel. You no, think that I had something to do with <laughs> your, your challenging, to, uh, had some, Karen, something to do with the fact that Taya was a, sort of a generation older, at least in my family, you know, my parents were a lot stricter with my older sister than they were with me. By the time I came along, you know, my oh, sisters yeah. would just tell my mother, 
I can't believe you're letting him do this, fill in the blank. You never would have fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And then the other question I have for both of you is, uh, generationally, was there a difference between your time in that community, Taya, and your time, Karen? Um, in our community, women weren't allowed to speak. Men were, you know, they took Paul's admonition for women to be silent and not pray in Sorry. public. So when my mom would give a Bible study, she couldn't do it in the church. She had to do it in our living room because women aren't in the pulpit. Now, that never changed in the, in the Presbyterian re reformed conservative communities I came from, I don't think. Uh, by the time you all were coming through all this, did you ever see a woman in a pulpit other than the choir leader or a Bible study or something, you know, as the actual pastor? Or did you have that same level of misogyny? We, we did not. Uh, in fact, the, the lady that was the first lady of the church was really an inspiration to me. Um, mm. her, her, you know, the late Carol Boyd was amazing. And I, I think what I learned from her was how I could be creative. She was a woman who wrote poetry. Um, mm. She told her story in a way that was beautiful. She sang her story. And I think a, a good part of why we're successful, as Karen alluded to, is because we saw women um, that were like Ruth in the Bible or sure. people that were, were like Esther. And so mm. we, I think I gravitated more to people that were a little bit... Um, you know, aggressive in their approach to questioning the mm. status quo of spirituality. And I think that that helped me ask the right questions and it helped, it motivated me to move in a way where I could really discover who I really was. Yeah. And so we did not have that level of dogma, but you're right, in some cases, women were not able to adorn the, the pulpit. They had to go to the lower area mm -hmm. to speak, but we were, we had a very strong, um, women's movement and I think during the time that I was raised was not only during the civil rights but it was also during the the, the women's movement that Eleanor Roosevelt had laid the foundations and that's the beauty I think of the women's business um, collaborative is yeah, that WBC, they, sure. yeah they, they look at the alliances and social movements that are necessary for women to um, engage and to advocate in and and so um, I think that that's what I saw. And, and again, Karen, you know, comes from a different place, but we lived in that neighborhood um, shortly. And then we moved somewhere else. We, you know, there was a, a change in the space, uh, which gave us a little bit better opportunity. Well, Can I add to that? Cause you yeah, mentioned. Yeah, please do. Yeah. So I, I think from, so by the time I was in my like adolescence and youth, we were church hopping. I mean, we were, mm -hmm. so I was able to see, right? Different, different um, formations, right? Of what religion, how religion could be distilled and how it could be expressed. And I think for me, when I was an adult and moved to Chicago, right? So there's the Southern PAW and then there's like Chicago PAW. What took you to Chicago, by the way? Just on the way. Yeah, so residency. So I was going to residency training as an obstetrician gynecologist in Chicago. And that was my first time going to a church where women could wear pants, mm -hmm. where I saw the first lady in a pantsuit every Sunday. <laughs> and I was like, and I would be telling my mom, she's like, what? And I was like, I have on jeans and a t-shirt on a Sunday. No, I'm yeah. kidding. Well, that church, yes. But then I went to another church where you could rock the regular wear. And like that woman, and Anna Hannah, like I adore her, mm -hmm. Pastor John of Ministries, for me to see and did not like to go by the name First Lady because of what that meant. And in, yeah. in, uh, in, in our sense, it's not just misogyny, but misogyny war because you add on the racism, right? So mm -hmm. to see a, a, a woman who, and I'm not trying to tell your story, Anna, but it was very moving for her and her husband to be very transparent that she had a, a marriage before. She mm -hmm. experienced divorce. Her mm -hmm. story was very powerful in surviving different levels of abuse and being um, having a multiracial background. But what resonated the most with me is that she is a nurse mm. and she uh, um, is a sick nurse in the cardiac intensive care unit. So Anna is dope and brilliant. Right. And to have <laughs> that sense, again, of uh, educated, and I'm not saying the women in the church before where we grew up were not educated, but again, if you are taught that going to school 
is being in the world and you're supposed to only be of the world, then a lot of people did not pursue education as aggressively mm -hmm. as they did because they felt they were committing a sin. So mm. for me to be in my 20s and 30s now and at a church worshiping where the, the first lady doesn't come to New Year's Eve church because she loves to work at the hospital mm. on New Year's Eve in the SICU, mm. that was affirming for me that I could be a very powerful healthcare worker mm. as well as be um, very active in um the movement of the church in terms of helping the community. And mm -hmm. I think what I also learned a lot of our, our service, right? We did a lot of community service. I mean, like the things that we did as young people and as adults, just because of our membership and wanting to be active, service is so key. And that's why I keep saying like the, what I will always take away is the leadership and the service and being in the community and, and being in a place where everyone looks like you mm -hmm. because when you're, when you are outside of the, the the church, you don't always see people like you in the health, right? And in, in law and health and policy um, and business. And so, and when you do see them, they are experiencing horrific terrors, right? Mm -hmm. Of those systems oppressing or silencing them or stigmatizing them. So I do think there is a place for, for there, there are benefits to what we saw and us, again, being able to, to really not extract that it was transactional, being able to see the support that we got to be leaders to like design a pro like I learned how to like design a program, fundraise, money mm -hmm. management, like sure. those are all skills that I really wish that, that young people and the, and the older people would see that we mm. really had a lot of skills that we were building that could be right. translatable into right workforce areas. So that's what I took is that I learned how to speak and learn how to hustle and get money and raise for a cause, a singular cause. Sure. Wherever that money went, we may not always knew, but yeah. I do believe that we learned ways of mobilizing, right? Like mobilization, right. movement building, mm -hmm. shared values, shared goals, and and meeting those goals. Like so, mm -hmm. I that's for me is I learned how to be a leader, honestly, in the church. Now, the type of leader I am now would probably make a lot of our people freak out because I do, you know, I'm very clear around, you know, supporting people around their sexual and reproductive rights and identities, right? I'm, I'm just very clear about that. Um, mm. But I do believe we learn so much from that, right? And that environment, yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting, you, you both had talked about the fact that there was kind of a tension between I guess I could put it this way, science and learning versus spirituality in your church background. That's very much like mine. You know, when when Donald Trump came along and called everything fake news and if anything bad is said, it's not real. You know, if you connect the dots all the way back to my childhood, uh, we kind of invented a separate universe to live in in which facts were not going to intrude and bother us. And of course, that primed us to not accept climate change when that was questioned. That primed us to not accept the lessons of evolutionary biology and psychology. That primed us to not believe politicians who said things we didn't like. So, you know, this whole dichotomy uh, between, between facts and, 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 all, 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 and fake news and all this, my evangelical background already had told me, don't believe what they're teaching you in biology because that's the world. You know, we have a six day creation and Adam and Eve don't believe them when they're telling you fill in the blank, whatever it was. I don't know. Did you share some of that before before I get that answer? Let me just give a shout out for the Women's Business Collaborative that got us all together here when I saw Taya on a program we were sharing in a little square on Zoom. That's the only way I meet anybody these days. OK, so you're as real to me as anyone I've seen for the last couple of years. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I said, oh, I want to interview her. And my producer, Ernie, got in touch and we got it all going. But um, Edie Fraser and the WBC um, call out for them. Thank you so much for making this yes. possible, introducing us all. That said, how do you feel about that dichotomy? Look, you're both scientists. You're both in the medical profession. You're both educated. You're both education educators and activists. And you've just very eloquently and beautifully mirrored something I say, which is even though I feel I've moved to a slightly different place, I look back on what I learned within my little fundamentalist Christian community. And 
you know, turns out my mom was right most of the time, maybe for the wrong reasons. I don't know if that may sound crazy. They were so much better than their theology. Yeah. So I'm grateful for that background and the stability it gave me. I'm in no sense disrespecting it. But when it comes to looking at the quote world's wisdom and rejecting it, you talked well about that, Taya and, and Karen did as well. It, obviously you've gone in a very different direction because you're both on the cutting edge of science. You're medical people, you're, you're a whole different breed. You're, you're sciencey people. Right, so, so, so a public health, you know, I'm a public health advocate. If, if it's supposed to promote and protect people in the communities where they, they, they live, they play, they, they work mm. um, and learn, then they ought to be able to thrive in those communities. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that what we have learned from the, these experiences is that service doesn't escape you when you get into a conversation with someone who's trying to decide, do I eat mm -hmm. and feed my kids or do, you know, what do I do? And we, and I've seen that closer than Karen. And my mother has had to make some hard decisions, but I think she was ahead of her time um, and certainly her circle of friends to really not be distracted by the barriers that we faced. And I think we live in a world now, we're structural barriers. I'm, I'm a little less, um, more tame than Karen, uh, but I do it with grace. And I think that that's what we're called here to do is to not call out an issue that we're not going to be willing to help solve. Mm. And part of that is looking at not only the impact, but a sustainable solution. Yes. And, I, and, and I really love what the Women's Business Collaborative does because it's accountable for, for women and not just women. It, it is inclusive and they're they bring about pathways for people to be able to sit at the table. And so Karen and I are able to sit at the table, but now we have to be responsible and we have to be responsive to the needs of the people that we represent just based on our lived experiences. So, mm -hmm. you know, and part of that for me is being able to be creative in what I do, but also empathetic. And with the opinion that, Everybody should have the right to, to access good health. Mm. Um, and I learned that from our leader here, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, is that when she looks at you, she says, what is possible with the person that's sitting in front of you? Mm. And that sticks with me on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so we're, we're having a conversation that's so good that I forget to do the interview part. So forgive me. <laughs> I'm so, <laughs> because I feel like I've just sat down somewhere and said, hey, how are you doing? We got talking and I bought you your next cup of coffee and so on and so forth. This doesn't feel like an interview. So um, let me try to be more of an interviewer here because both of you have such incredible co accomplishments and you're both involved in, in causes that I want to share with people. So you're, <laughs> uh, Taya, let's talk about what you do at the Morehouse School of Medicine as if I'm an actual interviewer and not just having a conversation for a minute, get official on me. <laughs> sure, sure, I'll get official. So pretend so I, I pretend I'm just a regular interviewer and oh. we're just doing the thing. What do you do for you know? Tell us about that because I really am interested and I don't know enough about it to ask intelligent sure. questions. So save me from my ignorance. Oh no, no. So so I I work at Morehouse School of Medicine and, and our mission or vision is is leading the creation and advancement of health equity. I serve as the chief innovation officer, which in my mind really supports the entrepreneurial spirit of MSM and how it, mm. it advances health equity and it's and, and it's in which we do have a world-class health equity model for the nation and beyond. Um, we, we explore innovative and sustainable approaches to workforce creation um, and mm. development. And how do we improve human capital? You know, how do we keep that humanism in, in building better or re-engineering processes yeah. and measurements. So really, it's really transform, transforming lives and looking at it from an individual basis, 
mm. of giving people what they need when they need it in the amount that they need it. That's health equity, which is not equitable. Mm. And, and so, and then working that outside of the community. So that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Let me ask you a question about that and dive in for a minute. Um, if your vision of health equity came about, you could push the red button and it's all changed. Uh, in, in layman's terms, because this isn't my field, and I, as I said, I don't know enough to ask intelligent questions about this. How would things change that I would notice and other people would notice immediately, and then maybe more subtle changes in our entire healthcare delivery system, race, gender, equity, everything included, mm -hmm. but just the health part first? Because I think, you know, I'd really like to see in the best of all worlds, what would we be doing different? Right. So I could use an analogy. So the Atlanta Braves, we just won the World Series. A lot of people talk about people being able to have access to that game and their mm -hmm. various levels. If there's a fence and I have three boxes and there's a tall guy, there's this middle guy, and then there's a short guy who can't see over the fence. Mm -hmm. Why would I give the tall guy a, fence, a, a box to see the game? And really, to me, health equity is, is, is that there's no, no fence at all. There's, there's no boundaries or limitations to what I can access. And I believe that, you know, when I think about my experience, the one thing my mother always said to us is always have insurance. And she always kept insurance. And we were able to uh, receive that benefit just based on her working hard. So that means that there are other people that are probably maybe half a mile away in a different zip code. And I'm thriving in the zip code, but this other zip code, they don't have food uh, or fresh vegetables. They don't have access to broadband. We're on this nice Zoom piece, but sometimes people don't have access to simple things. So mm -hmm. if I could press a button, people would have the, the level of access that they need in order to, again, thrive and be able to sustain a lifestyle that's conducive for them to be able to feel like I'm important, I'm inspired. And then the other part to that to me is, is how do I transfer that? So my part of my role is, is not to, to provide impact and options, but what are some things that I can give you in a, as, as far as a toolkit is concerned mm -hmm. so that you can elevate where you are, but also reach back and to transfer that to other people. So that's what that means to me, is that people are, are allowed to, to, to really be what we call the pursuit of happiness, that it's not a political play, but it is something that we are allowed to do because it's just the right thing to do. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's a wonderful summation. Now, before I ask you a similar question, Karen, let me just get one more thing from you. Uh, Taya, and that is just tell me a little more about Morehouse. I know about Morehouse and other people do too, but it has a magnificent history. It, it uh, does. I don't want to, I don't want to breeze over that. So give us a little Morehouse sure. history. So, so Morehouse School of Medicine was, was founded about 47 years ago mm -hmm. under the leadership of Lewis Sullivan, who served as one of the secretaries of HHS, Health and Human Services. And he saw the need, he was a Morehouse College man, but he was also a advocate before his time. He saw that there was a phys physician shortage and there were not people of color who were being served by people of color. Hmm. And so he worked with the former and late president that I think that was great as well, um, President George uh, H. Bush, to frame what we needed to uh, develop this medical school that could provide culturally competent uh, folks to serve as physicians or public health advocates and to replenish um, the nation with people who really understand what health equity is all about, mm -hmm. but to also be tr a trusted advocate to those in the various different urban and rural, rural counties. And what I can say about Morehouse School of Medicine is that we lived that mission today under the leadership of Dr. Montgomery Rice. And it has, it has moved into other aspects of outside of Georgia. So within mm -hmm. Georgia, we have a 65% uh, 
uh, impact to the state of people that actually stay in the practice mm. in primary care. Wow. They're your ob gynes they're your internal, your internist, um, people who do cardiovascular. Mm. And so they stay here. So that's an economic impact uh, that supports the state with people who are trusted by the people that they see on a day-to-day -day basis. And mm. I think that that's important to know is that we are here to diversify the healthcare workforce and we don't deviate from that. But now we have built uh, partnerships with other uh, entities because if you look at the data and you look at the funding from the National Institutes of Health, a lot of historically black colleges don't necessarily get the funding from that traditional setting. So now you have companies like Google and Microsoft and others that we work with to help expand and explode this mission because people recognize that the pandemic has uncovered uh, racism mm -hmm. and sexism and classism. And I think that Karen can probably give a lot of detail surrounding that, but we, we recognize that racism is a public health issue. Sure. And a lot of people have declared that, uh, including the, the CDC. Mm. And Karen, before we dive straight in, because your sister, Taya, built you a wonderful segue, but I'm not going to let you take advantage of it because I want to go back a step. And in the same way that we just did with Taya, um, you are, uh, you do OBGYN, you practice a form of medicine that also has a social dynamic to it because you are also an activist when it comes to the inequity Mm -hmm. that Black women suffer in our system, which Taya is touching on. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell us what you do professionally, but also what you do in terms of the, the social dynamics of what you're doing and take us through that. And then we will come back and my memory is, is crappy. So my producer, Ernie, will remind <laughs> me if I forget. And I'm such an idiot. I asked two and three part questions. The guest remembers them. I forget what the third part was. So you you both are 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 going to have to help me here. But I want your your what you do, and then I want to jump back in where Taya left off because it was too good a segue in terms of the yeah. inequity. But then I want to focus that on women, and I want to focus that on the whole OB world and what you do. Yes, thank you. Um, so. And so, I, so a lot of things are going through my mind. So I'll say that thinking about when you talked about earlier, right, science and religion, I, my bachelor's degree is in molecular biology. So I initially wanted to obtain a PhD so I could, you know, crack the genetic code in favor of Black people, to be very honest. And mm -hmm. when I got to college in the 90s, I, uh, my, um, my one of my mentors, Ren Edwards, who's a, a lesbian plant physiologist, teaches you know, all the biology and plant physio stuff, but she also taught the biology of female sexuality. And that for me, I always have to tell that story because I did go to King College, it was a liberal arts school in the cornfields, you know, private, so very selective. And I went there, got a full ride, but while being there really helped me to formulate, you know, the questions I've always had around like women in, the, in our communities, like how do women make the decisions that they make, what are the choices, whether they're constrained, coerced, or forced, like how do they navigate, again, those systems? So I'm in college thinking I was gonna do mobile, but really after learning about Billy Avery, the original founding founder, of the National Black Women's Health Project, mm -hmm. it resonated with our experiences. Like here is a black woman who is navigating horrors of the healthcare system and then finding that other black women are also right being dismissed. This is not new, this is not contemporary, it's historical. Their mm -hmm. voices are being silenced or sabotaged. Their, their request, not even request, expressions of help mm -hmm. to support their ways of being healthy. They're dismissed, neglected, all those things. So I was so moved by Billy Avery's story and her activism and building right, these clubs or these groups of Black women across the country, I created an informal, unofficial group at Kenyon College. There were no Black women professors at the time that I was there. And I felt that how could I go to medical school never having been taught by a Black woman about Black women's health? So mm. I created my own Black women's health study. And, um, and it was with two sociology faculty, though I'm in the, I'm a mobile person. And I'm saying that to say that I've always questioned 
how people have and they don't have. I've always questioned how from the 1900s, our, my research in college shows that Black women were dying with diabetes and having mm -hmm. amputations. Like those, if those things are problems centuries ago and they're still happening now, then there is a systemic, right? Structures and systems are in place that allow for differential, right? Access, differential utilization, differential outcomes and its power. So I thought becoming a physician as a black woman who grew up poor in the South, that that would give me authority to be heard, to be listened to, if I'm going to transform healthcare delivery models. That is the whole reason why I became a physician. I never said I wanted to take care of patients. And I think that's very important because medicine is one-to-one -one care. I didn't know that in the 90s. So I thought being a physician would help me do this population health impact. Because I said I wanted to transform, transform healthcare delivery models. Physicians do not do that. And I'm just saying that because we don't. We provide one-to-one -one care. We may be transforming health in our practice, in our office, in our department, in that city, but that's not reaching a county, a state, or a national or global level. So I've really struggled. I did choose to become an OBGYN because I did fall in love with all the components of the medicine, the surgery, the science, the relationships, the continuity, protecting people's rights and building their agency and self-efficacy to make decisions about their life through their body. Um, but I also learned about the histories of OBGYN and the horrors. I'm not gonna go through all of that, but I will say there are going outside of medicine into and learning from the humanities and social sciences. We will learn that in our country, there were partnerships between OBGYNs and plantation and slave owners. And to learn that after I've become an OBGYN, after learning the history of oppression and control and degradation, and dehumanization, particularly in the South, I had to ask myself because my mom taught us to be honest and mm. to be accountable. How am I complicit in recreating the horrors of the past of antebellum, you know, postbellum South? By being an OBGYN right now, a contemporary OBGYN, I'm reproducing those experiences, those outcomes, those forms of controls and constraints over people's bodies with capacity to reproduce, to get pregnant, to have a, a menstrual cycle, like all the things to feed another body through your body, to, be, to feed another human being. Mm -hmm. So it was really when I was introduced to reproductive justice. Um, though it was coined by Black women in 1994, I didn't hear about it in 2010, four years after residency. So though I have loved the access to trust that being a Black woman OBGYN has afforded me, I have unconditionally been disturbed and disappointed and hurt hmm. by the way our field willfully remains ignorant and arrogant about the harms that we enact upon, particularly Black and Indigenous people, women and people across generations, across centuries. And so I no longer practice. Um, my last call was April 16, 2021. I actually stopped doing gynecology January 20, 2015 and obtained my master's in public health and applied epidemiology. I did different types of fellowships because I'm, you know, because of massage noir or sexism and racism in most professions, but particularly in medicine, I kept trying to find external validation for my vision, for my experiences, for my identity. And so I always was in conflict with leadership because I am the empath. I am the person of integrity. I'm the systems thinker right? I am a public health scholar. I am the person that thinks about behavior and measures and how do we measure that behavior in order to create change? And then how do we keep the change sustainable over time? How do we build a workforce, but also a new workforce, but also support the existing workforce, right? Like we talk about generations. There's an existing workforce that will look at me when I say massage noir and, be, and say, I, I don't even know what that is. How does that relate to me coding, right? To me billing, to my reimbursement as a physician. So for me, it's been 
my responsibility to be multilingual. And that's why I have all these other experiences. I can sit at tables or in rooms with policymakers, with public health scholars, with epidemiologists, with data people, with nursing, with midwifery, with, with OBGYNs, with anesthesiologists, because I have always been the person that saw things in a global way, in a systems way. And I think that's where the conflict is because physicians are one-to-one -one care. That's, right. that's what we're tra trained to do. And I'm always thinking about the humanistic part and the systems part. So I chose to stop practicing to build my consulting firm because I really want to make an impact on the system and systems across the nation. Let me back up a minute and we'll get to the consulting after this. Let me ask the same question I asked Taya. Let's say the ultimate vision that you have of redressing the inequities of the past, present, and heading to a better future happened, that what you believe and what you advocate for through your consulting and public policy work happened. How would Black women coming to the medical establishment who would they find caring for them? How would it be different? And I guess the way you're going to have to do this, if, if I ask you as a favor, is give us some pointers from the history and the present in terms of the inequity and the, the wickedness that has been visited upon Black women in America from the year dot to the present. And how would that change? What would specifically be different in your future? Mm. That's a loaded question. It's a great question. I'm trying to think. So I think what first comes to mind is, um, is autonomy, honestly, autonomy and agency. So historically, mm. when OBGYNs partnered with plantation and slave owners to sustain a, a labor force of slaves, mm. what our country and the world knows about the reproductive health systems comes from centuries of exploitation, experimentation, extraction without consent, without compensation, mm. um, without autonomy. And so there are extractions happening from enslaved black women and men and girls and boys where in order to sustain right, the, the slavery, you have to control how we not only reproduce other future slaves, because the law said a child born of a slave, regardless of the father, is a slave. Hmm. Even if you thought if you through rape, there are multiracial people that that was a path for freedom. It was not because the 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 maternal or matro lineage is what determined right, our legacy or our future potentially. Well, that happened, right? Today, it's the race of the mother that determines the race of the infant on the birth certificate. Hmm. And if people understood there are things that we did during slavery that we reproduce in public health and epidemiology, we're tracking people by their race, by their mother. So what in that and the identification or the labeling of race is not actually asking the person, it's someone judging their skin color. Hmm. The brown, if you know, the brown bag, right? The brown bag taste, test. If we were lighter than a brown bag, paper bag, then you could pass and go to certain spaces. But that again was someone else judging, right? Your race. And so I do believe race is a social construct. We created it so that we can reinforce the hierarchy of human value. But again, that also determines experiences, but we should be asking. So again, back to consent and autonomy. To me, it would be people have the right, right? To if, it's, if an action of sex intercourse creates a pregnancy, then we should be asking what that pregnancy means. It shouldn't automatically be positive tests get you into prenatal care. You haven't asked that person what that pregnancy means, how that pregnancy came about. Mm -hmm right? Was it forced, coerced? Yeah. Right? Um, and then with that, I do want to just speak out, not speak out, but I just want to call in to like, there's so many people, like one in three people are survivors of, of rape, some form of sexual um, 
and gender-based violence. And so mm. if one group is saying sex out of marriage is a sin and you unfortunately experience violence through your body, then you have to reconcile, am I a sinner? That's right. So again, to me, it's like just being, um, supporting people's capacity and capability to make decisions about their body. They stay pregnant, they don't stay pregnant. They stay pregnant and then they birth. Well, who's gonna be there? Is it a physician or is it a midwife? right? Historically, OBGYNs, white male OBGYNs and white midwives try to eradicate Black grand midwives. Our country was birthed by Black grand midwives. Black grand midwives had better outcomes than actual physicians. It was the professionalization and medicalization of its human phenomenon of birth, Mm. right? It's how we eradicated midwives because a group of white men who used to use, um, um, like another word, what's the word when you're like a tutor, like the, um, you are, they weren't medical schools then, but people were just learning to like, let me go. Sure, through. like apprenticeships. Yes, that's the right thing. Like, like there was apprenticeship. And so the professionalization created medical schools. And if we go with medical schools, then we have to talk about, um, and now I'm thinking all the things I want to take, the Townsend Shepherd Act and the, the Flexner Report. Mm-hmm. Both of those were very detrimental. The Flexner Report closed down historically Black medical schools. So when we talk about, when Tay is talking about diversification of the workforce, by closing down the very institutions that would only receive Black people to become physicians, then you have a long-term effect of who is caring for us that had some form of a shared experience, Mm. right? Because of skin color or because, I'm just going to say genitalia, because of sex. And the Townsend Shepherd Act, um, you know, putting saying that mid- community professional midwives were, were not as rigorous or as intelligent as those who were formally trained through nursing. There's all these levels of division. Like we think yeah. about destabilizing our communities, gentrification, right? Urban development and renewal. All of those fundamentally destabilize social institutions and mm-hmm. social relationships, mm-hmm. mass incarceration, not only of our black men and boys, but also of our um, black LGBTQQIA siblings or nibblings, right? All of them. And then add on, if you are a woman and you are pregnant, there's been a higher incarceration of pregnant women shackling. And most of the crimes that a pregnant person commits are low crime. It is not something of violence. So again, we have to really think about, again, the systems and structures that are in place that to me, when they disproportionately impact one community, Hmm. why is that? So though we may have the right to vote, though we may not be enslaved, look at all the other things that are happening to us from having premature deaths, right? All of the black men who have died of heart attacks right now in their forties and fifties, right? All of the, the state police shootings, like there's data, amazing black and brown scholars who have been looking at relationships between state police shooting and premature birth. Mm. right evictions and mm. premature birth i look at nativity whether someone was u.s born or, or foreign born black person mm. and how that impacts the rate of preterm birth or low birth rate like and again it goes back to this shared experience of living it being born in the united states and being nurtured and nurtured and nourished or not in the united states as a u.s born black person and how mm. education higher education, higher income, the data, when we say we stratify or we control for those factors, it means that even if I have optimal prenatal care utilization, I have a college degree or higher, I make six figures, I live in this gated neighborhood, I am married, I am heterosexual, and my Black man husband is like a politician, like all of those social protections, they actually disappear and it's actually worse worse outcomes for affluent Black men and affluent Black women because of the chronic and repeat exposure of being in hostile systems where we're constantly having to prove that Mm. we belong. How much more proving can that be? So as a healthcare, as a, what I would love, like, you know, why why don't we have universal healthcare? Like, why is access to insurance tied to employment? That's right. It's another level of stratification or division. Um, why do we only have maternal or parental leave? You know, we don't even give 
men, right? At least some states do. But imagine if it was parental leave and not maternal leave, right? Yeah. There was gender roles. How many more households could see men contributing to mm. the caretaking? Right? Yeah, so- and, and you bring up a point there because, of course, men, and that includes white men who are at the top of the system, when they are offered parental leave, sometimes don't take it because our our culture is so geared to defining us all by our career title. That's right. They're saying, well, I'll never make serious senior partner. The last guy that took six months, our firm offers, they don't take them seriously anymore. And then of course, what's a woman supposed to do? Because she already isn't supposed to ever have a family or or freeze her eggs or something because the system tells her, hey, we're not taking you you seriously if you even pretend to have any other interests. Right. right. And, and, and then if you throw in being a black woman on top of that, it's right. like, come on. Well, uh, think about like Medicaid, Medicaid back before the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, before the ACA, I remember being in Chicago and it, and it dawned on me, the only way to get Medicaid before the ACA was to either to have some, I should say, public support, public insurance was to either be old, old, elderly, yeah, be poor, living below a poverty line, or to be pregnant. So when you ask, right, mm-hmm. a, a group of people who were valued for being pregnant at 13 and sometimes nine and 12 and were sold sure. on the auction block because they were the most fertile young slave, enslaved black woman. And then now you say, oh, teen pregnancy is a disease we must eradicate. But mm-hmm. the only way to get insurance is being pregnant. Then you have to ask, <laughs> and what is the d- incentive, right? Yeah, is that if pregnancy keeps me with insurance and therefore insurance for my child? Well, and somewhat autonomous in a system that otherwise is going to reject you anyway. That's yeah. true. Those are all the things that I think about all the time that most of my colleagues as OBGYNs were not thinking about 20 years ago. And so yeah. that's why it's been really difficult being a traditional OBGYN because I'm constantly seeing what, like my family. Like I purposely didn't go to a particular university for residency because they, and there's a paper on this in the New England Journal of Medicine, that residency programs, because of how they are funded, um, not because I shouldn't say that, how they are funded, <laughs> certain populations, like those who must utilize or rely on Medicaid, there is a differential learning process where in certain universities, the residents, right? The learners, physicians who are learners, they're residents. Mm. Their clinics are usually filled with patients who rely on Medicaid or no insurance. Whereas the faculty, the private patients, those who have commercial insurance get to see the attending. So when you think about, again, healthcare and the quality of healthcare, why would, again, if if we were to believe black people are biologically inferior, if, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying we are, if our system believed that, then why would you continue to relegate us to the worst level or quality of care to the most experienced person? Mm-hmm. And so right. are you then saying you are sick, therefore I'm going to give you the least experienced provider to navigate your multiple comorbidities? So I ask questions saying, what is the meaning to that to our community? So when I was training and interviewing my fourth year, I purposely didn't go to certain schools or rank them high because I'm like, we grew up poor. We went to the dental clinics of Meharry. Like, why would I, how could I philosophically and ethically and morally go somewhere mm. where you would treat my mom or the women in my family when we live in CWA on South Fifth Street like less, like subhuman, not even a human, but subhuman. So I constantly think about the way people feel when they're navigating the system. And as Tay was saying, we want people to feel whole. We want people to not only feel whole, but have access to a repository of opportunities and options and the instructions and guidance to use those tools, but also to be able to get to the system with the tools, right? So this every step of the way, we have to be thinking about how people are able to pay and reach and seek um, and engage a system. And if nobody in the system looks like me, And I already know historically how the system has treated me and contemporary. Every day there's, you know, there's news media about another black woman dying in pregnancy or in childbirth or in the postpartum while they're seeking help. They're dying at the hands of physicians. You know, I I would want there to be a restoration of the humanities Mm. in health services provision. Mm. As you were talking about, you know, 
if advancement and promotion, particularly for men, and let's say white men, requires dissociating yourself from the parenting, right, and the partnership, then think about, I think of you hearing, I, when you say that, it made me think about the qualities that a medical school traditionally wants. They want all of the folks who are in the, the biological or the natural sciences, right, who didn't value history, anthropology, sociology, art, dance. That's why I went to a liberal arts school because I wanted a holistic curriculum because I'm a whole human being, right? A whole human being. And I don't want to deny as aspects of my identity, my growth and my development in order to gain entry into mm -hmm. like your club. And so that's what I would hope that we would build a different workforce of nurses and physicians, and I should say lactation consultants and, and doulas and social workers who have who value human beings mm -hmm. and meet them where they are, but also know the communities from which they reside. As Table St. Mm -hmm. Public Health says, where we live, we work, we play, we pray, we worship, also where we have sex, where we build families. Do you right? find uh, <laughs> Taya and Karen together, do you find that um, the message, if we can call it that, because that's what you've been doing here, Karen, is giving us a message. Uh, um, is it falling um, on fertile ground these days? You know, thinking of the parable of the sower, is it all rocks mm -hmm. and thorny places? Are you being, are you being wow. heard? Do you see anything I, growing? I, you're, I think you're casting, so. You're casting, you're sowing here. Yeah. Is something growing. It's, it's funny you just said that. And, and, and so I'll, I'll go back to what I've, I've, I've said in the beginning is that my mother charted a path for success. And I, for, for my oldest sister and I, and we walked Karen uh, through that path, is that what she did was, is that she charted for me what was my collective social responsibility. Hmm. So there's corporate social responsibility, but there's a collective social responsibility that I feel that Karen and I and others have. And when you talked about the seeds, the one thing that I will say is that part of what we are, are, are really um, called to do is to sow, sow good seeds of truth and integrity, mm -hmm. responsibility and, and accountability and justice. And, and I think that as many voices um, that echo this, but also work towards that advocacy and speak truth to power is how we move the needle a little bit more. And I don't want to be so aspirational that I'm not, uh, you know, level-headed about there is, there is a long ways for us to go. But again, the universal health care or even the transformation of what we call Medicaid, um, you know, which, which has some of its problems. But I think that that's what we're doing now is, is casting and, and there are some things that we've reaped that have been great, but I think that, um, you know, again, we just have to keep moving this, this whole uh, social movement towards the responsibility of, of people like us. And it seems to me what you both are doing um, is in a way building us a model so mm -hmm. that should, by the grace of God, and I'm choosing those words carefully, yeah, we, we get more enlightened leadership as time goes by, no matter how, right. how bleak things seem at present, that it's not like they're starting from square one when they say, well, we want to do better. You yeah. can say, we've been thinking about this a long time and we've made a few strides, but now we've got some serious folks in charge. Here's the program. We have the suggestion for you. So I think, Karen, in a way, you're building a future model ahead of its time. But by, but by God's grace, you know, you, you both are stepping out and doing something that, you know, I hope and pray at some point has a mirror image of willpower mm -hmm. in the in the level of leadership we get at state and national levels that says, OK, we're going to build on this program now, very much like climate change. The science is there. We know what we need to do. What That's we're right. lacking is the willpower to do it. That's right. You're providing the the I, i'm not going to call it science because that's it's more than that but you're providing the you're providing the program mm -hmm. now we need to find the political will to do it is that's that right. do, you, do you think i've interpreted that correctly i i do i mean i i, I 
like going back to your your seed analogy, I do think we are right. I do think we're not only sowing seeds. I do believe we are the seed, right? I mm. do believe we're the seeds. I That's think good. we are the seeds of our mother. So you know, as Obi Wan, I'm always thinking about reproduction. So I think right. <laughs> we are the actual seeds, and I think that right there's not only your given family through biology but there's your chosen family so i think that we also have seeds that we're seeing and we're coming together um and i think that the foundation also has to change so i know for me yes. i when i do my trainings right i know no, no one's gonna always agree with me and so i say i'm actually not here to change your values. I want to show you the consequences of your values. Mm. And in showing you the consequences of your values, then you, I would like to raise your consciousness. Yes. Right? You say I'm is, that, is that, is that what you do? I, 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 I'm very bad on lingo, but is this the cultural, <laughs> the cultural competence forum? The cultural rigor piece. So for me, okay, you know, all right. that's right. So cultural rigor comes from, um, Melanie Turbalon and, um, Jan Marie Garcia, both are Black women in the Bay in Oakland who were pediatricians and mm -hmm. um, had a public health background. So they were MD, MPH, that is me. And they saw these things happening in the children's hospital. So they talked about cultural humility, right? Like uh, meeting people where they are, recognizing the power differential, mm -hmm. um, really you know, building people's agency and their efficacy and participating in the healthcare, not us as physicians telling people what they should do, mm -hmm. but really listening, trying to contextualize this person's experience of health, not just the disease management piece. Right. I'd like to get a, a bit further with cultural rigor and say that the science has to do there, right? What, what mm -hmm. are the methods in which are the steps? Also the steps that we use to collect information and to make sense of that information. And I think about the ethics and the theory. So for me, it's the seed and it's the ground. I'm yeah. trying to simultaneously plant better seeds or different seeds that have different outcomes where the consequences of values don't lead to someone's premature death. That's honestly what I tell people. Like your expression of your value is your yes. behavior and your language. That's yeah. right. So let's get your language and your behavior in the chart, right? Have what you had any success in getting some of the... Oh, yeah. Larger yeah. medical schools to invite you in to talk well, to some the of their thing. interns and students about this so they get a little bit ahead of the curve on this. I So I'm going to say that in different ways. So I'm going to be mindful. So I believe my biggest advocates or in this work are foundations. Hmm. I get funded by foundations, not by NIH. I think foundations are understanding their role, right? It's the funder who usually mm -hmm. sets the tone of the research. The kind of the public philanthropy angle. Yes. And That's so right. if we can, so by holding philanthropy, and I have an article on that in health, health equity, the, mm -hmm. the role of first do no harm, if philanthropy can understand the ways in which they set the agenda, the, the, the institutions they yes. fund to do this work, the questions that they ask and the teams and, and the presence and participation in an equitable way of mm. community from design to dissemination information, that's all the cultural rigor piece. And so mm. I have foundations who support me. I have hospitals and health systems and state perinatal quality collaborators. So mm. people who are thinking about, right, honestly, it's going to, I'm going to say it down to money, right? People's the patient experience and what does the satisfaction survey say? Sure. And so I'm trying to get people to understand that even if there's a quote unquote good outcome, mm. if you don't understand the experience, right, right, the impact of the process of care, right. then you may have like in our case, in our study, a black woman who had a full term baby, a healthy and normal weight baby that latched appropriately, that did not go like have to be admitted into the intensive care unit for little babies and a vaginal birth by traditional standards of care and science. Someone would say that was a good outcome mm -hmm. and we've achieved equity. And then that same participant said, though he put me back together because there was a tear mm. and the birth, can, you know, the vaginal sure. area came out, putting back together as a surgeon, um, repairs that area, which is normal. Though you put me back together, I still don't feel whole. Mm. So when we choose measures mm. 
that don't involve the patient experience, then we create a standard that may be true if we keep doing it, right? It may be yes. accurate because it's, it's repeating after, after repetitive behaviors, we get the same outcome. That's accurate, but it may not be precise, meaning yes. the outcome is for a person to feel whole. Then we can't just do something that comes out good over and over again if it's not really hitting the mark. And the mark is for someone to feel whole. So we should have good outcomes and people feeling like whole human beings, mm. feeling that their dignity is honored. So that's where I come in. I help systems rethink their ethics. Mm. I help them rethink the theories that they use to interpret and see the world. Mm. I'm like, how are you making sense of your own data? What's the story you want your data to tell? Because right now your story says, it, I'm going to be really, really blunt. Your, your data from your hospital says that you kill Black women. <laughs> and I say it, I'm like, that's what your data says. You can say mm. that Black women are more likely to die, but that's displacing the onus of responsibility. Sure. We don't go to the hospital wanting to die. So why frame the conversation and all the headlines? Black women are more, no, U.S. hospitals are willfully watching as we die at a higher rate than white women. That's what it really should say, because if we start there, then you look at the system. You don't blame the individual. So I really help people around their ethics, their theories, and then their methodology. Like mm -hmm. what measures are you using? What role did the community play, right, in helping you choose that measure? And I'll give an example. You know, the ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences, a, a, a series of questions to ask adults to reflect back on their childhood about certain things that were traumatizing. And you can get a score. And then that score can now be used to look at the association of childhood traumas and health outcomes like strokes and heart attacks, mm -hmm. reproductive health outcomes, right? <clears throat> the worse the childhood trauma, the worse the health outcomes. Well, that scoring system was based on folks who were in a healthcare system where everybody has health insurance. So some level of privilege and power. Mm -hmm. Well, a black man, I forget his name. He is a pediatrician in Philadelphia. Was like, hmm, we're looking at experiences in, in, in youth and adolescence to predict adult health outcomes. Let's go to young people and ask them versus starting with an adult. So he got together urban youth mm -hmm. and then looked at that measure. And again, black youth saw that score. So when marriage when, we, when divorce was seen as a childhood exper um, experience that predicts bad outcomes, well then if in your community, marriage doesn't have a high right uh, prevalence, but you use divorce to predict trauma, you're going to underestimate trauma because you chose a phenomenon that's not common. So, but really what are we saying when we say marriage and divorce? We're really saying is there one or two adults in the household present? to care for the family. Mm -hmm. So change the measure. Instead of asking, did your <clears throat> parents get divorced? When you grew, grew up, did you have one or more adults in your household? Because that question becomes more inclusive and you can That's get it right. right. You capture more people's experiences. Yeah, and actually covers questions. the world as it right. is. That's what I do. That's what I do. I go in and say, your measures are not precise. Let me let me uh, pause <laughs> here and say, you know, we're going to need to continue this conversation. So I, I hope you know, there's this generic, oh, this has been so great, you have to come back. But actually, you have to come back. Ernie knows when I'm being serious. Uh, you have to come back because we need to pick this up where we've left off next time around and just dive straight back into these issues of public health policy, mm -hmm. Taya and Karen, uh, and really pursue it and start and start going after this and find better ways to promote um, you know what you're doing to the folks who listen to this podcast. Um, we will uh, Ernie will ask you for all the links you want to share. They will appear everywhere where this is, mm -hmm. uh, where you want people to follow up. Forgive me for not being able to get the title and the, the complexity of everything you all do straight. Um, we like I say, it was just too good a conversation. But you must, we must continue this, and I want Ernie to to get after it and schedule. Uh, so that we have a part two to this discussion. And next time around, let's start with all these policy changes we need. And let's also dive into the history of the mistreatment. You know, I had to bite my tongue and not go after the specifics on the collaboration 
between the doctors in the gynecology world of the South at a certain point and the slaveholders. I mean, right there, I, I want to talk about that. You know, these are these are things that, you know, they're so shocking. It's hard. It, it's hard to do a follow up question because I don't know how to phrase it without sounding like I'm trivializing. Oh, tell me a little more about this. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so I don't even know how to do this, but we need to dive into the history more. Yeah. I and mean, then we also need to dive into your suggestions more and really take them one, yeah. one piece at a time. So please, let's do this some more. Um, this is in conversation with Frank Schaefer, a Facebook Live event um, that also goes everywhere, that podcasts go. The links to Taya and Karen's work and who they are and everything that we can share with you will be everywhere this appears. Um, my new book is uh, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. It is everywhere. And um, I would appreciate some support on that too. So thank you so much, both of you. Please uh, work with Ernie to come back and let's just pursue this again so uh, that we can do justice to far too much to talk about here and especially take us through more of this history, even though it shocks the sensibility. And then let's get into the policy stuff and really unpack more of that from both of you. I can't thank you enough for your wisdom, the work you've done, uh, the lives you're putting on the line here for something that's just so, so burningly worthwhile. Thank you. It's really humbling to be talking with you both. We appreciate you. Thank you, Frank. Much Thank up. you for having us. Thank you so much. Bye, sister. Yep. Bye, Frank. Take care. Bye. Bye. Take care, sister. Bye.